right now we're at about 8,000 feet and we're dealing with a lot of turbulence and heavy rain. That's because we're right in the middle of the storm. So right now we're going to the MacDill Air Force Base here in Tampa and it's about 2 a.m. and I'm just waking up at the moment but I'm excited because we're about to take a plane ride straight into a hurricane. Yep, I said hurricane. You're probably thinking you can't fly a plane into one of the Earth's most enormous and destructive forces. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing with these guys, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Hurricane Hunters. This is where the, the Top Gun music kicks in right here. <laughs> Whenever a hurricane brews in the Atlantic Ocean, this crew is on alert, ready to fly straight into the mouth of this monster with a plane designed especially for this. Some people may say you guys are crazy for going into a hurricane. Um, but it seems like you guys have a pretty good safety record. Well, we've, we've, uh, we've never lost a plane, we've never lost a life um, flying into, the, into these storms. People would say we're crazy, but uh, we train hard, we know what we're doing. We're all very experienced, and obviously we don't take things lightly. We flew around 1,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean on an 11-hour round-trip flight to rendezvous with a massive hurricane named Gonzalo. A hurricane, also known as a typhoon or cyclone in other parts of the world, is a tropical storm over warm water that gets help from the Earth's rotation and low crosswinds. The storm becomes a hurricane when the winds reach 74 miles per hour, but they can pack winds of more than 200 miles per hour and span over 1,000 miles across. That's about the distance between Kansas City and Washington, D.C. We finally made it to the storm, bouncing around and even getting sick along the way. Then, an eerie calm. Right now, we're in the calmest part of the storm known as the eye. Sometimes the eye gives you a false sense that the storm is over, but in reality, the second part of the storm is just about to begin. Boom, we're back to the craziness. Why are these missions so crucial to the people on the ground and those who are in the path of the storm? Uh, the data that we gather, the in situ data, the in the storm data, um, you can't get from anywhere else. You can't get from a satellite, you can't get from a buoy. Hurricanes account for millions of dollars in damage every year. That damage comes from an arsenal of high winds, heavy rain, storm surge, lightning, and sometimes hurricanes even spawn tornadoes. And scientists say we could be in for bigger, badder storms because of climate change. Just last year, we saw the strongest hurricane ever recorded. Patricia's wind speeds topped at 215 miles per hour. There's still quite a bit of research to be done on whether we expect to see more, you know, more frequent hurricanes or more hurricanes in a given average hurricane season. But there tends to be agreement that the hurricanes that we will see on average will be stronger in a warmed world. These storms feed off warm water. And over the last century, ocean surface temperatures have gone up by around a tenth of a degree each decade. And experts say hurricanes could travel further north more often because of climate change. That's why flying through these massive storms is so important, because of what these scientists can learn. We see all this different instruments, different technology. What does all this do? What you're standing on is the most sophisticated weather research aircraft in the world. And these things, called drop signs, and just like it sounds, they're dropped out of the plane while in the hurricane. They send data back to the plane about things like wind speed, barometric pressure, and they're tracked by GPS. They help the scientists make more accurate predictions. How does it make you feel that you may save some lives by doing this? You fly a rough storm, you get beat up pretty good, uh, but you know you're not doing it in vain. You're doing it because there's people on the ground that matter. And there's people on the ground that need to evacuate. And uh, it definitely leaves you with a sense of pride when you land and you can feel like you've changed somebody's life that day. Keith Kosinski, Channel One News. Windy, guys. Radar's down, it's not updating. Oh, this yeah. is a mess. Race against time. I was on the hunt for one of weather's greatest mysteries. 
Tornado is very destructive, although most are short-lived and not deadly. The ones that last longer can, can wreak havoc with uh, people's lives and their things. Riding along with students from the Ball State Meteorology Program. When you told your, your parents, you said, hey, mom, dad, I'm going storm chasing for 12 days, what was their reaction? First, they thought I was nuts. They see all the tornado damage, and then they realized, you know, it's what I wanted to do, so they, they decided to support it. Every spring, a team like this leaves Muncie, Indiana to spend almost two weeks searching for extreme weather. Most of them have never seen a tornado in person, so it was a test of taking what they learned in the class and applying it in the field. Do you think you'll be scared once we get close to one? Uh, I think I'll have a healthy fear. Tornadoes can have wind speeds up to 300 miles per hour. They can span miles across, leaving a path of destruction behind them, leveling homes and tossing cars. The United States is the tornado capital of the world, averaging about 1,300 tornadoes each year, many in Tornado Alley. From South Dakota to Texas, where warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, cold, dry air from Canada and the Arctic, and warm, dry air from the Southwest converge. When that air collides in massive storms, scientists think it creates a horizontal spinning effect in the atmosphere. Strong updrafts then tilt the rotating air from horizontal to vertical. It becomes a tornado when the rotating funnel touches the ground. Some scientists say tornado season is starting earlier than ever, and Tornado Alley might be moving, shifting east. Many of the climate models project that drying will move east. That'll have a huge impact on where, where we see storms, because storms essentially happen where it rains. And that's because moisture is the lifeblood of thunderstorms and tornadoes. And as the earth warms, areas that once got a lot of moisture are drying up. There's not a clear consensus on how climate change will affect tornadoes. We know with warmer temperatures that would probably lead increase low level instability, make it easier for air to rise into storms. On the other hand, the upper levels of the atmosphere would probably warm as well, and that may make it harder for the warm air near the ground to rise. Climate change is going to reshuffle the deck in terms of our weather. Scientists say it's hard to know if or how much climate change is affecting tornadoes. These storms are still a bit of a mystery, and predicting them is nearly impossible. We were already nearing the end of our second day into our hunt, and we still hadn't found our prey. It's kind of a disappointment, but you know, everything's a learning experience. Just as we were packing up, something promising showed up on our radars. We're heading north uh, to hopefully hit a line of storms that looks uh, pretty, pretty good for us. We hit the gas, covering over 100 miles north into Kansas. Then there it was in the distance. The monster we had been chasing. There it is. We found our first tornado. I am pumped. While it was a rush to see, luckily this tornado didn't cause any damage. But of course, that's not always the case. It's important, a goal of science is to understand the world around us and how things work. Tornadoes and flash floods and hurricanes, these all are things that not only are good subjects for movies, but also affect real people. While tornadoes are awesome to observe from a distance, they're nothing to mess with up close. And this damage here in Delmont, South Dakota is an example of their destructive power. Here on this farm, cattle were lost, silos were destroyed, and farm equipment was beat up. You're looking at this tornado damage here. I mean, how does it make you feel? What goes through your mind? I'm just sadness. I'm overwhelmed. Like, I can't imagine, like, going through this at all. At least nine people were injured, causing thousands of dollars in damage. It's very sobering to us as meteorologists to see this, and uh, it's a good reminder of, of how important our job can be to help uh, protect people. After 12 days on the road, Traveling through nine states, we never did see another tornado. Our hunt may be over, but these students are still on the chase, learning more about tornadoes, how to better predict them, and hopefully save lives. I hope that we can 
through our efforts and our research and our studies that we can help. So there's no fatalities, there's not as many injuries. Help people get out of the way of it. Keith Kosinski, Channel One News. I think a lot of people, their identity in the West is tied to water. Is scarcity a serious issue? Yes. With climate change, we're not so sure of the future. I thought the energy problem was the big crisis, but this is really more fundamental than energy. You know, we could be living in sheds with sticks and rocks, but if we don't have water, we can't live. So it might be painfully obvious, but it's worth remembering. Every single one of the seven billion humans on this planet needs water to survive. But right now, one billion of us don't have access to it. How important is water? Uh, I mean, I'd put it above everything else. And now everyday water is becoming a valuable, fought over resource. In less than 15 years, it's predicted that around half of the world will be living in areas of high water stress, meaning access to water will be limited the U.S. included. There's no reason why the United States is special in terms of how it will feel the strains of some of these climate change risks into the future. How much does climate change impact water scarcity? I think it plays a pretty huge role. Population growth in this area has placed a higher demand on the supply of water we have, but also that supply has been decreasing due to climate change. The basic difference between the droughts of today and the droughts of the past is that climate change is making the world hotter, meaning normal droughts are becoming bigger and badder. Well, we're already seeing it. Look at the droughts that we've experienced throughout the western states. Here, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor, many areas are experiencing a prolonged extreme or exceptional drought. The Colorado River is central to the southwest, which in terms of drying impacts from climate change is right in a bullseye. Some of these places are persisting based on shipping water into those locations. The question is, how long is that sustainable? These students at Colorado College have been monitoring the Colorado River as part of their State of the Rockies project. 40 million people rely on this river across seven states and then into Mexico. So we're talking about an enormous amount of people. Agriculture that comes out of this region supplies any salad you might eat during the winter months and is likely being grown with Colorado River water. The Colorado starts as snow in the Rocky Mountains, makes its way through seven states, and flows all the way to Mexico. Along the way, cities have built reservoirs, large man-made lakes that get filled with water. We head out on Lake Powell, the country's second largest reservoir. As you can see over here, we're coming up on some bathtub rings. And it's here that we find ourselves literally surrounded by signs of the water crisis. So what does it mean when we see that big white stripe? What does that tell us? That stripe is the water level of Lake Powell at its full capacity. And that was in the 90s, so we've, we've had about nearly two decades of drought since. So that is not a good thing. That is not good. And as that water level drops, millions of people feel the effect. People not only are seeing it in their daily lives, but also how they manage their home and how much they pay for water at a household level. Lake Powell and the Colorado's other biggest reservoir, Lake Mead, work kind of like credit cards for water. For decades, cities throughout the Southwest have tapped into them whenever they needed it. But now both reservoirs hover around 50% capacity or less, making experts question what's gonna happen if the credit runs dry. The West is built on water conflict, legal challenges over who owns rights to what water. There's no reason to believe that as climate change reduces water throughout, particularly the West, that these kinds of conflicts will only intensify. The threat of water-related conflicts has even gotten the attention of the U.S. government. A recent report from U.S. security forces warned of potential conflicts over water in many areas of the world that are important to American interests. And while they said a full-scale war over water remains unlikely in the immediate future, it did caution the use of water as a weapon or to further terrorist objectives will become more likely beyond 10 years. Now add to this threat of conflict the pressure of migration. People need water to live, and in the locations where water is becoming more and more scarce, you can imagine scenarios in which people are forced to leave the places where they're currently living. 
And it's not just the West, it's the entire country that faces a huge problem. Decision makers and planners really need to start digesting these kinds of projections that are being made of the future and asking the hard questions about how to actually manage their water more effectively so that we can make the water we do have go farther. Maggie Ruley, Channel One News. Keep an eye on your dinner plate. It may look different in the future because of climate change. As droughts last longer and temperatures continue to increase, America's food supply could be in trouble. Water is fundamental to agricultural production. And as many parts of the United States, the West has been in drought over different areas for the last 10 to 15 years. Let's go back to your plate. You have your broccoli, some potatoes, and a hamburger. Now look at how much water it takes to produce each part of this meal. 2.2 gallons for the broccoli, 25 gallons for these potatoes, and a whopping 450 gallons of water for this quarter pound burger. He's jumping, there's a reason I need to jump. Steve Tellum is a cattle rancher in San Diego, California. He raises his cows on an open range. Each cow drinks 10 gallons of water a day, or 3,650 gallons of water a year. Over the last 15 years here, we've only had basically two good wet, rainy years since 2000. Today, California is facing one of the severest droughts on record. This has complicated farming so much that many ranchers have had to sell off their cattle just to keep their businesses going. About 15 to 20 percent of the severity of the California drought over the last three years is a consequence of global warming. Here in the last four years, we have basically cut our cow herd down by over 50 percent. This is the smallest number of animals that, I, that I've had in almost my lifetime. What are for these cows to drink? What are to help grow their food? And also what are to clean their pens? In fact, add that all up, and that's more water than the people of California consume each year. A lot of water for a small slice of beef. Higher water costs means cows are more expensive to raise, making beef more expensive to buy. Most people, when they walk into the supermarket, all they see is that package of meat right there. You've got to look back, where did that meat come from? Who supplied it? Who grew it? Growing and caring for livestock is also an expense for the environment. Cows naturally release methane gas into the air, a greenhouse gas similar to carbon dioxide, but 23 times more hazardous. So farming cows leaves a pretty heavy carbon footprint on the earth. Eating one hamburger is equivalent to driving your car around for three days straight. Many environmentalists are pushing for us to eat less beef, which would cut back on the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But beef isn't the only food causing concern. Other forms of agriculture like grains, fruits, and vegetables are using a lot of water, especially in the Golden State. California produces more than a third of the nation's vegetables and two thirds of the nation's fruits and nuts. To grow that food, farmers use about 80% of all water used in the state. So nationwide, the average American consumes more than 300 gallons of California water each week. What is this? This is my main shutoff for the water. Enrico Ferraro is a California farmer in the San Diego area. He produces about 10,000 pounds of avocados a season, but has had to cut back due to the rising cost of water. Some of the neighbors out here have been dealing with higher water costs and higher labor costs. At some point, it no longer pencils out to keep the property going, and so they've shut off their water at this point. On top of this hill, you can see what's left of the neighboring farms, and it's pretty deserted. Rising temperatures have made avocados much more expensive to sell, so many farms are shutting down. But avocados are a high-value crop, and they are important for the agricultural economy of California. A recent study estimates climate change could kill more than a half a million people around the world by 2050 by making their diets less healthy. The expectation is as temperatures increase, yields will decrease in specific areas. We have 7 billion people on the planet currently. We are expecting at least 9 billion over the course of this century. So that's a lot more mouths to feed. Ariel Hickson, Channel One News. So all of this, there was no water. It was just land. Just land, just land. Like there wasn't no bayou right here. 
there wasn't no lake, as you can see out there. It was fields, and then farther back, all you see was trees, you know? The land that Dominic and Damien Nikon's ancestors have called home for more than 170 years is sinking into the bayou here in Louisiana. As the younger generation, we're watching our land slowly fade away. And as that land disappears, so does their Native American tribe, the Biloxi Chittimachi Chalked Out. It just seems like there's nothing we can do. Nothing to stop it. Nothing to stop it. Now just a quarter mile wide and a half mile long, the tribe has lost around 98% of their land, in part due to rising sea levels from a changing climate. Climate change really, really affected them because you know, we used to live off the land. Now we can't even raise chicken. Albert Nikan is chief of the tribe. He already lost his home and had to leave the island. Now the entire community is relocating, making them the first official refugees of climate change in America. How have you noticed things changed from when you were a kid growing up on the island to now? Day and night. Yeah. yeah. The land that we trapped on, now we ride in that by boat. The road that you came on, that was land on both sides. Now it's just water. So the, the changes are huge. Isle de John Charles is just one small stretch of the more than 95,000 miles of shoreline that make up the U.S. But their story of loss could become a common theme for the more than 123 million people who live in coastal communities in the U.S. That includes New York City, Boston, and Miami, where on days with just a high tide, the streets are flooded. As of now, we're kind of drastically losing land, but it's just not happening here. It's happening all over. And while predictions vary, most scientific models estimate a one to six foot rise in sea level by the year 2100. To see what this rise might look like, we head out on the water with Professor Matthew Brown, just off the coast of Florida. Do you think people living in those houses right on the water should be worried? The ones that are smart should be. I wouldn't necessarily want to buy property, you know, right on, right on the water right now. Rising sea levels are threatening coastal communities. What's the difference between historical rates of sea level rise and fall versus what we're seeing now? Sea level rise and fall that's related to natural climate variability tends to be much longer term. So sea level rise that's changing on the order of 50,000 years, 100,000 years, 200,000 years. The sea level rise that you hear the scientific community talking about that's likely related to human beings is occurring on time scales of decades. The world is getting warmer, causing glaciers and ice caps to melt into ocean waters and making sea levels rise. But along with just more water, that water is also warmer, and warmer water expands, rising sea levels even further. Now by exactly how much and how soon? Well, that remains unclear. Yet for Professor Brown, it doesn't really matter. You can look at tidal data from a number of cities and sea level rise is creeping up and up and up and up and up. It's like if I said to you, there's a 98% chance of rain tomorrow, and you say, well, wait, no, there's only an 89% chance of rain tomorrow, and we're bickering about whether we should bring an umbrella. Just bring an umbrella. And whether or not we grab that umbrella will have global consequences. Two-thirds of the world's biggest cities are on the coast. For Albert, he hopes his community can serve as a warning for these others at risk. More communities are going to be like us in the near future and probably a lot quicker than what we think. With the help of a federal grant, his tribe is relocating further inland. We lost the community, and there's the idea of trying to resettle where we could put the community back together. Saving their community, even if they can no longer save their land. Maggie Ruley, Channel One News. That's sort of really cool. Fix it out of nothing. It's just before dawn, and the mosquito abatement team is on the hunt here in Louisiana. We're seeing it's heat right now. Yes. Kevin Cayuet and his former intern Ben Rowley are using yeah. heat seeking technology to search for bird nests. Oh, well, there he is. There he is. Because baby birds can be a major source of food for mosquitoes and a breeding ground for infectious diseases. They're essentially like the fuel. Mosquitoes require blood to survive. But while feeding, they often pick up viruses and other tiny parasites along the way. One mosquito can infect one of the baby birds, which don't have any protection against the disease. 
then other mosquitoes can all come over and get the disease from the bird that's already infected. At night, there can be thousands of different mosquitoes landing on one nestling alone. From there, it's possible that one of those mosquitoes will go out and feed on a human, biting them and passing along what could be one of a long list of diseases. Primarily in the United States, it's West Nile virus. You know, other areas of the world, it's primarily malaria and dengue. And we have new threats all the time. This year, the threat is Zika virus, and so we're looking out for all of those. For many people around the world, those infectious diseases can be deadly. According to the World Health Organization, mosquito bites result in the deaths of more than one million people every year. Mosquitoes pose a very real threat that could potentially get worse here in the United States because of climate change. People should understand that climate change isn't about polar bears, it isn't about glaciers or penguins, it's really about people and the effects that it'll have on people. And that, uh, in a very real sense, uh, is linked to their health. Mosquitoes thrive in warm, wet environments, as do the diseases that they carry. All infectious diseases have a particular environment in which they prefer. And climate change changes that ecology in profound ways, causing those diseases to be found in areas where they haven't been found before. Yeah. Probably Ooh. close to 100 mosquitoes in that trap. Louisiana and many other states in the South are no stranger to these pesky bloodsuckers. In fact, here in the St. Tammany Parish outside of New Orleans, they have a whole arsenal of weapons to fight them. So we have 15 of these spray trucks. Pesticide trucks, planes, and even this tank-like vehicle. But not all states are as well prepared. Our weather patterns are changing, bringing more rain and heat to new areas of the United States and creating suitable new homes for mosquitoes. But it's not just the summertime climate helping mosquitoes flourish. As the U.S. comes out of what was its warmest winter on record, this spring is sure to bring out the insects in full force. The winters are less severe. Fewer of them are being uh, frozen in the winter. More survive into the next spring. And with spring comes another threat to your health. This one, a little less creepy, and probably one you would least expect, but can be deadly nonetheless. Pollen. The first frost is happening much later in the year and the last frost is happening much sooner in the year, so extending the growing season. Which can be very dangerous for asthma sufferers like Michaela Rogers. It's like something stuck in your throat. The wind blows and the pollen gets like in your airway and you can't really breathe. <laughs> Pollen is one of the most common aggravators for people with allergies. Again. For people with asthma, those allergies can trigger an attack which can be fatal. One in 12 people in the U.S. have asthma. That's about 25 million people. And those numbers continue to rise every year. Some say that pollen could be to blame. Not only are the pollen seasons getting longer, but they're also getting more intense thanks to increased carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. The amount of CO2 in an urban area is higher than it is in a surrounding rural area. We call it the CO2 dome because uh, there's locally higher concentrations produced by all those vehicles. That stimulates pollen production. We're getting levels that are 10 times what we would find in the rural areas in urban areas. And with the climate continuing to change, it doesn't look like people will be breathing easy anytime soon. One study predicts that by the year 2040, the average pollen count will be over 21,000 grains of pollen per cubic meter. That's more than double what it was in the year 2000. So from pollen to pests, there may not be a perfect solution to fighting all of the health threats potentially brought on by climate change. But scientists say with more research, they hope to continue to stay one step ahead in this ongoing battle. Maggie Ruley, Channel One News.